Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite A-list of food writers. And as we head into a new school year after our summer break, we'll be talking about cooking in schools again. But this time we're travelling back in time to the early 1970s when a young Jenny Ridgewell, clad in miniskirt, knee-high boots and tank top, was teaching an unruly bunch of London kids to cook. They would get me to bend down and look in the ovens, you know, and there were some times when I just didn't get what they were up to, um, which was c- quite often quite naughty. Jenny has since written many cookery textbooks and founded the Nutrition Programme, an online analysis of recipes and meals. But her memoir, I Taught Them to Cook, is a hilarious romp through a year in 1970s London as she negotiates the classroom and the life of a young singleton. It also pulls focus on what food was then and is now. Prue Leith called it a light-hearted testament to the importance of food, education and a sizzling expose of the blindness of the powers that be. I began by asking Jenny about teaching teenage boys. So 1972 was the first time in state schools that boys were allowed to take cookery. Um, And when I arrived at the school, I got an influx of boys that didn't want to do woodwork and metalwork. The textbooks were beyond appalling. All the questions said housewives do this and girls do that. And it assumed that boys weren't in the equation from the history of the sort of 1950s where men went to work and came back to a hot dinner cooked by their little women. So I was training the girls to be good housewives. When they had to, they did, remember they did a two hour practical, two and a half hour practical. And this was often, how would the mother prepare a packed lunch, make something for a packed lunch that includes a pastry dish and a, and a cake for the husband and children to go on a fishing trip. It was all about the little housewife doing things. It was a school where the men worked in the docks or worked in the print works. And it was a completely white school. I taught in further in, in London, where I taught Afro-Caribbeans and Turkish and Greek Cypriots and all sorts. But I arrived in a very traditional working class white mixed comprehensive that had been a secondary modern. So the expectations were low. So you were a young 23-year-old. The book is actually a, over the course of a year, but it's a parallel of your life in groovy London and you just starting a relationship with Mark, who turned out to be your husband in the end. So it's a very funny, wonderful sort of memoir of your life in London at that time. But what you tell us is really important. Uh, it's the story of how we lost our way with food, isn't it? I mean, looking back now, can you pull together that trajectory of those boys, those white boys and girls learning to cook in that school at that time in 1973? And what's happened to our food culture in this great city? I think we're learning the real respect for multicultural food, the huge diversity that's in London. But I had to teach to a curriculum that that wanted them to cook cakes and pastries and sauces. Um, We had to do invalid cooking. They had to know how to lay a tray, starch a tablecloth, things from the Victorian age that drove me nuts. And at the time, it was also very difficult to buy rice, to buy pasta, to buy all the things that I was experiencing in London, in Chinatown, or all the restaurants that were coming up at the time. So I was living two parallel lives where I knew there was something over the fence, but I had to teach high fat, high sugar, non-nutritious dishes to get them through their exam. It's interesting what you say about that. You know, cookery lessons in schools have been compulsory to the age of 14 since Ed Balls brought them back Mm. to tackle obesity Mm. in 2008. And he wanted to stop what he called the trivial type of cooking like decorating pizzas Mm. and he wanted to bring back skills Mm. but you know you're talking about 1972 1973 those skills that you were teaching them were were pretty strange kind of skills to be teaching young people weren't they except i could be as diverse as i wanted to so if i wanted to teach them how to make a stew how to use a pressure cooker i had a slow cooker in schools we gutted fish. We went down to the butchers and we learned how to cut up a lamb. Um, I could do what I wanted to because I was in charge of my department. 
we certainly don't have those skills now. I mean, we barely have butchers and fishmongers. Somehow we, we really lost our way and the impact is absolutely enormous. We're now seeing a super, super rise of obesity since lockdown. We, we had an obesity epidemic before lockdown. Now we're seeing even more so. We've got appalling statistics coming through that people are not being fed properly at home. People don't know how to cook so much so that children are one centimetre shorter than our European counterparts. Our kids are stunted. I mean, malnutrition, not being nourished properly. Where's this lack of ability to feed ourselves come from? I want to readdress that. In teaching today, they are absolutely putting back how to join a chicken. Remember, in 1972, I didn't teach chicken. Chicken was so expensive, we ate it at Christmas and Easter. So it's not in the textbooks of the time, and, it's, and it wasn't on my agenda, which seems very, very strange. Um, they are doing gutting fish. They are doing, um, they're looking at the diversity of vegetarian meals. The teachers in schools today are addressing it. The subject needs more respect today. Cooking has always been um, a subject, in my opinion, where you put somebody that can't do high-level maths or high-level English literature, you know, go and do... They'd send me children that, that you can't do that, so go and go to do cooking. I mean, there are lots of issues with cookery schools in schools. I mean, I talk to a lot of the kids who I work with at the Food Foundation and they are, they tell me that you have to buy the ingredients for a start. Uh, a lot of people who are facing in food insecurity can't afford to take ingredients in, especially when you can't take them home because of health and safety. So you what you, whatever you cook in class, you can't take home. So you imagine where you're trying to make the decision between heating and eating and you're asked to pay for ingredients for your child's cookery lessons that you can't take home and feed the family it's not going to happen back in the day you had ingredients to, to to cook with not always i was given a 50 pound allowance for the whole year to buy books and to buy ingredients it was the same issue there as it is now it's the one subject where you have to bring things to school to take the lesson you don't do that for art you don't do that for science you know you it's really, really unfair. When I first worked for ILEA, they believed that children should have free ingredients. So I provided everything for this multicultural class. So in 1970, we were providing free ingredients and everybody could cook. There was no discrimination. Again, taking things home, I don't quite know where that's come from because it's an odd one if you've got chill compartments in your schools. What I used to do in school was the boys didn't want to take things home. They don't want to carry a basket with things in it. So I'd open my room up and we'd, we'd eat and I'd find out all sorts of things as we sat at the tables and ate together. And they'd share all sorts of stories that, that were maybe private. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is the glory of teaching, isn't it? Mm. And I mean, a story from when I was teaching in Wandsworth, when I came back to London, a friend of mine, a journalist, wanted to know about um, graffiti. So they were all gathered at lunchtime eating the food we'd cooked. And I said, do any of you know anybody that does any graffiti? And I got the story of somebody that did the biggest tags around this area. And when I went out on a bus, I could see his tags on distant walls. They take He'd take them on tours to show his tags so there were there were things that you learn by sitting and talking and eating as you know yeah let's go through some of your food moments um angel delight tart why did you choose this as your first food moment i'm very ashamed very very ashamed of teaching them um with a ready-made pastry that i bought and brought them in, get them to bring in a packet of angel delight and mix it with i'm very very ashamed <laughs> but at the time it was like when you have your first McDonald's. Angel Delight was a, a, a food moment of heaven that all of us thought was so delicious. Now we know a bit better because we can read the ingredients and go, what on earth is that? Um, but at the time, it was spectacular. And I, you have to teach convenience foods. So I wanted to show them how you could make a dessert really quickly from buying everything. But it was a bad thing to teach, really. <laughs> But it wasn't really, because what you really wanted to do was get them excited by food. What were the kind of questions that were on the exam papers? The, the questions on the exam papers all related to what the mother would do, the housewife, and were very difficult. Um, if I can read you a question that I had to train them in, I had to train them to get through these. This is vegetarians, and the book I had to use, this is the question from the exams. 
Why are meatless dishes often unpopular? How can this be avoided? <laughs> now, I have to teach to the exam. I have to get them to answer this question and indoctrinate them in the belief system of the examiner, which is not me. Yeah. I became an examiner eventually and thought, I'm going to change this because this is absurd. It was at that time that people started moving away from cooking from scratch to getting stuff that was at least semi-prepared. And I presume that's what you were teaching in terms of convenience food. The revolution was on then. We were, we were into mass-produced foods that were made from I don't know what. I can't remember when detailed labelling, I don't think it was there at the time. No. So we didn't know what we were eating. Yeah, I mean, it was the rise of the supermarkets not that long ago where people suddenly realised that it would become more convenient to bulk buy from a supermarket and to buy stuff that had already been in some way prepared. I mean, it wasn't ready meals as, as we get now. Well, certainly I had packets of Vesta curry which smelt delicious with dried ingredients in and all the spices, but this was an East London school, a white East London school, and eating exotic foods like that, they went, yuck. It was a struggle to get them to do spaghetti bolognese. You know, we not, I hadn't ever cooked pasta. And, and I mean, that, if you like, is a convenience food. Zena Skinner was on the television, and I saw her showing us how to cook it, these great long strands that I bought from an Italian delicatessen in Hampstead, very posh, and took them into school. And, and she'd said, when it's cooked, if you throw it at the wall, it will stick. Well, the boys took glee in this, and my room was full of swirls of cooked spaghetti that either stuck or fell behind the work surfaces. But they began to change and see that, that this sort of dish could be taken on. And, and we were cooking the sauce, but I had to cook the sauce from tomato ketchup and meat and lard. I don't remember many tin tomatoes being for sale. Keeping the boys engaged in that cooking, you talk about the teasing around making fairy cakes um, and tarts um, and rubbing in and knocking up. I can imagine the hilarity, but that kind of contributed, didn't it, to keeping them interested. It was about getting humour involved in teaching them to cook? Initially it wasn't because you have to take charge of your class and you can't show that you understand what their knocking up jokes mean. <laughs> I had very, very short skirts which I put a pink nylon overall on um, but they would get me to bend down and look in the ovens to check that their cooking was doing. You know, and there were some times when I just didn't get what they were up to um, which was qu quite often quite naughty. I went to Bristol University and I had a Bristol sweatshirt and I was playing the teachers versus the students in a hockey match and they were laughing on the sidelines and I didn't know because, of course, Cockney rhyming slam, Bristol, Bristol City, titties. So that was the end of me wearing that. Um, you know, there were, there were double entendres that I didn't understand. Like when I arrived somewhere and, and I thought I looked quite glamorous in my very short things and somebody said, what are two and eight? And I said to Cynthia, who worked for me, what does that mean? She said, I'm sorry, it means what a state. <laughs> When the kids were going home with this kind of new interest in, in cookery, what were they watching on telly? I'm, well, I suppose the Galloping Gourmet would have been on, but was television engaging these kids in cooking on, on telly? Did they bring back stories of that? I mean, in the way that Jamie Oliver absolutely trained a, a whole generation to, to be interested in cookery. The sad thing was at the time, they could leave as soon as they reached 16. So many of the boys left to go and work elsewhere and never got a qualification in anything. From what I remember, they were teenagers that were out and about. We never had, there wasn't any influence. These were lads that would go out fishing in the Lee Valley. They went gambling. They'd go to the Walthamstow dog track. And what they were bringing back, would they cook and eat? I mean, if they were going fishing, would they just throw it back in and so it was sport or would they bring it home to eat? They certainly knew um, with the jelly deal stalls and, and the fish there, they certainly knew about eating a sort of wide variety of East End shellfish and prawns and, and that sort of thing. But their, their meals were definitely meat and two vegetables. They, were, they had to go back to traditional meals at home. And one girl certainly said to me, when I was trying to teach them salads in the summer, she said her gran had said she had to have a hot lunch and she couldn't eat it. There were very traditional views on what you ate and when you ate it. And, and the evening meal was a piece of meat and two veg. 
your your second food moment is about vegetarian cooking. The textbooks were saying that there was a limited choice. That the textbooks actually said that vegetarian、uh, cooking can lead to stomach enlargements. When I'd gone to work with the exam boards、um, to mark question papers, I was told that what was said in the textbooks was what the answer was. And when I kind of squeaked in in because I did a science degree, and when I squeaked, it was kind of be quiet.、Um, it's in the textbook. It's right. And this was to me was I ended up writing my own textbooks.、Um, to me, this was horrific. That how did this stuff get through? And how why did I have to teach it? And why was this correct? And clearly, the writers had no idea what a vegetarian was. Because it it wasn't something that was discussed, you know, and the meat and two veg culture would certainly not have con- would would not have considered it in some way.、Yeah. And I and I was teaching them things like nut roast, which was they found horrific, and so did I. It was not appropriate recipe for teenage boys to learn. But at the time, I didn't know anything about it either. There was cranks going on in Soho, which had amazing、um, different foods, but these wouldn't have been. Acceptable by the exam boards, but you were teaching them lots of skills. I mean, the culinary skills. Most culinary skills around the world are about how to make the most of something that generally comes from the land that you don't waste because most people can't afford waste. You know, now Britain throw away six point six million tons of food a year, of which four point five million tons worth fourteen billion pounds is edible. Greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food and drink. You know the impact of food production on the it's the biggest on the planet. If, if food waste were a country, as I'm always pulling this one out, it would be the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. How did you teach people to to value food? Remember, this is teaching stuff that came from the war when there was very little, and part of the exam was that you, if you were making a pastry dish, and you cut off the edges from a flan, and you had spare. You made it into jam tarts. So I would go round as the examiner and check the rubbish bins to see what they'd thrown away, and if there was anything thrown in the bin, they'd be marked down. So they knew that everything we we were working on virtually zero waste. We did not waste, but that was coming from a wartime tradition that I knew about from my family. And, and was essential was was being taught in the seventies. Yeah, and also food safety and and freshness was absolutely part of what you were teaching them. Tell tell me about how you taught them about eggs. Eggs was my favourite topic, and when I came to write a textbook, it was the chapter I started with for the for the publishers to choose.、Um, I'd I'd gather them round and tell them stories of the egg, and we'd we'd open the egg and we'd look at the. Air sac that the chick would take its first breath from. We'd look at the chalaza that held the yolk in place, whether and show them the germ. So because I knew the science, we did the science, and and then I discovered if you rolled the egg on the floor, it came back in a circle, which they they found very amusing.、Um, I'd. There was no date stamp on eggs at the time. The little lion came in and the little lion went out. So we didn't know how old our eggs was, and I used to keep. Because I didn't know any better, egg wash in the fridge、um, to to wash all our savoury pastries with, and I didn't know how old it was. But we do. I'd keep eggs in the stock room, and we'd have to test them in salt water. If they floated, they were stale, and we didn't use them. So we did know how to test to see if the eggs were fresh. But they were such an important food. But this was pre salmonella.、Yeah. We didn't know anything about it. But it's a really important lesson, isn't it, to teach kids the connection with where. Food comes from. You did the same with cheese.、Uh, you talked to them about sour milk. You deliberately let the, it go off.、Um, you know, really important part of understanding the food process. Tell me about that. Well, in order to get some sour milk, I had to go around the school collecting from the workshops in the area where, where teachers would have hide to have their cups of tea, and there was often bottles of sour milk that I could then. I know it's not doesn't sound very hygienic, but I'd bring them back, and then we'd hang them through a muslin cloth to show how you could drain off the whey and keep the curds to make the cheese.、Um, and then I'd show them how you could make it from lemon juice and, and milk and curdle it up a bit like you can make paneer today. But I didn't know about paneer. And the National Dairy Council at the time had massive 
influx into schools, sending us huge resources, and we could go down there and they'd give us a demonstration on, on milk and yoghurt that was coming in and cheese, which was which they like going out of school. Yeah, it just doesn't happen anymore, does it? I mean, really, that's, that's, one, of the, yeah, that's one of the big problems. Uh, your final food moment is the actual practical exam. Um, now, they had to take a theory paper as well, but they had to really produce some amazing food, didn't they, in their practical exam? It, they had to produce a meal. They would have to then produce a side dish to go with it. They might have to serve a pot of tea. But, th- but this meal could be a quiche with mashed potatoes and vegetables followed by pineapple upside down pudding and custard. And then they might have to make some scones for tea um, and lay the table And for the CSE, which was for the people that didn't take O-level, they would have to do some task like wash a shirt and iron it or clean football boots. So in the middle of all this hasty practical work where you've got everything going mad, you'd have ironing tray cloths and starching things. And then they'd lay the table and it would look magnificent and the people from outside would come in and go, that's incredible. Yeah. What were you looking for in the exam? Teachers then had to mark their own exams. So I, I had 60 students and you had to, you marked them after their exam and they would have to stand outside while I went round and I'd have my tasting jug with, with spoons in, like the Bake Off, a tray. Um, and there was one time when uh, the student got icing sugar and flour mixed up and so I was tasting a ragu of kidneys with, made with icing sugar. You know, and they're looking, they're peering through the window Um, and they can see me kind of go, if they ever licked things, I wouldn't taste it. So if I saw them licking and um, the food did not get tasted, that that was out of the out of the window. But they'd watch and it would take me a long time to mark each dish. There'd be big criteria, the same as the Bake Off, um, only many more dishes than the Bake Off, because we're talking about meals here. So I'm marking, you know, are the vegetables cooked, not overcooked? Are they, are they decorated with chopped... Everything has to be garnished with parsley. You know, are the cream horns, do they wrap round and are they filled with cream and jam? Um, quiche not leaking out of the quiche. You know, they, they really were highly skilled by the time... Cornish pasties that, that were sealed and had a delicious filling to them. So, yes, they did know how to cook. You mentioned kidneys. I mean, offal was on the exam... Often, wasn't it? You never see anything to do with offal anymore. I mean, we are being asked to eat 30% less meat, but actually those nutritional, less expensive cuts have literally gone out of our culinary culture. What was the response from your students to that offal back in 1972? They called it awful offal because they hated coming to that lesson. And one lesson that I did was to do stuffed hearts, which were traditionally cooked at that time. And the butcher brought me a whole box, a whole tray of of hearts. And so I showed them how the heart pumped about the different parts of it, because I knew the science of it. And then we stuffed it with Paxo stuffing and put it in like bistu gravy and roasted it in the oven. And the idea was at the end of the day, they'd come back and collect it, which they didn't. They left me with all with these stuffed hearts and I had to go into the staff room. Of course, there were quite a few young men that had no supper and they bought them off me, thank goodness. If you go to Waitrose now in the freezer cabinet, you'll see two hearts for something like pound fifty. And I asked them uh, what they were used for. Had they got any recipes? And they said it's dog food. Um, I then learnt a bit about pate which I didn't know before and we and we switched to making chicken liver pate to try and teach because the girls you know it's important with the uh, the iron in offal in liver um, and whatever that at the time we were teaching that it was a valuable food to eat so I was trying to create ways and they and they actually really liked the, the liver pate yeah so we got round the awful offal by making something that they would eat by 1979, you'd, you'd become the chief examiner of the exam board. And then you went on to create a nutritional programme for schools, which is at the forefront of technology. That's your legacy, really, isn't it? From your experience as a teacher, you knew how to change things. What are the perhaps three main things that you knew that you had to change for a completely new nutritional programme? To teach the nutrition for them to understand. Stop 
examining cream horns as a high-level skill. Stop thinking like the Bake Off, forgive me, Bake Off, but that, that making high-fat, layered, greasy pastry is something we should learn and get marks from. Cut it out of the curriculum altogether. Buy ready-made pastry. Don't even teach it. It's not worth it. That's, that's a major thing. We need to be able to cook fast, nutritionally, and from scratch. So figure out what you can cook from scratch and and do it my nutrition program will analyze the nutrition of a meal and it costs it something i've got to do is to look at the cost now because there's four thousand ingredients on it and i'm kind of dreading what i'm going to find we used to do the cost of a meal in the 1970s because we were coming into the same time as now where inflation and petrol shortages but food was escalating and we had to know how to cook cheaply and quickly Third one, food education should be valued in schools and they should be provided with money to buy ingredients. So like the art provides paint and paper, you need food to cook with. Food has changed hugely, particularly in in London and the major cities in, in, in the UK, largely because of immigrant cultures. It has become much more interesting, much more diverse much more vegan and vegetarian. One of the problems I hear from the the ambassadors at the Food Foundation is that they know what to put on the plate because of cookery classes. They know proteins and carbohydrates. They know the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. They just don't know what the picture looks like on the front of the jigsaw puzzle. How has that changed? Do you think that there was a picture of British food in 1972 that those kids of yours could actually sort of put together? And how does that compare with the picture of British food now? There was definitely a picture. If you look at the old cookery books, it was two veg and meat. Um, we're going to have to completely change and use what commodities we can afford. But I think the picture should keep on changing, keep on evolving and keep fresh, keep buying local and things. I, th- I think it's totally altered from the 1970s and for the good. Food is about what's around you. What would you say to kids if you were teaching kids in a classroom now about bringing food to life in the way that you used to in the 1970s? Sit down and eat together. Don't have school lunches that take half an hour where you're in a junk queue and you just shove it in and it's just a form of energy to fill you up. Sit down, eat, talk, serve and enjoy together. It's as simple as that. There's some work that's being done as part of the National Food Strategy with Henry Dimbleby. Tell me about that. It's really important that that he, part of his policy is to get the government to agree that food education in schools matters and to fund it properly. There's a a, a Facebook group with 8,000 food teachers on it called the Food Teachers Centre. Uh, which you need to be teaching food to to join, uh, run by Louise Davis. She and I wrote textbooks together. Very, very important. The work they're doing um, in encouraging everything you're talking about, healthy eating, skills, modernisation, diversity, is going on there. And it needs to be celebrated. You know, they're they're doing boning chickens and, and filleting fish and looking at growing school gardens and things like that. The work is being done, but for some reason, food education is trapped in this misinformation that nobody's cooking in schools. And there's lots of people that are, but it's jolly hard work because of the the short teaching times, the fact they have to bring their ingredients in, the still perception that it's a low value subject. You know, you don't need it for a GCSE. All this history since the 70s has carried on. And I hope in my lifetime somebody will sort it because food education matters. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcripts to the show at jillysmith.com. Just click on podcasts and do sign up for my newsletter while you're there. You can also get in touch on social media. I'm at Food Jilly Smith on Instagram, where you can also follow my adventures in cookery with links online. Check the show notes and on Instagram, the full details of how to get cooking the books discounts on Leith's cookery courses. And I'll see you next week. 